A simple idea that raises interesting questions and leads to aesthetically successful results. Show up at some of the world's most visited and therefore photographed monuments and sites, turn your back on the very thing you've come to see and record the view that no one else is interested in. It's not the same as photographing a famous site from an unexpected angle, from behind the Hollywood sign as Robert Frank did in the 1950s, in order to reveal its local or grubby underside. Often, in Oliver Curtis's Vault Fass, the monuments do not even get a look in. What we get, instead, is an idea of what they look at. If we saw a single, uncaptioned picture from Vault Fass, it could appear quite meaningless or pointless. Once we've seen a few, with the locations indicated, we begin to understand what we're looking for in each new picture, even if we don't know exactly what we're looking at. Even without recourse to the identifying captions, we can try to get our bearings and, if we visited the place in question, we might be able to work out where we are in spite of the absence of the very thing that is where we are. That they are about looking is slyly suggested by the way that quite a few of the pictures seem to contain a symbolic eye or pair of eyes that returns our gaze. Once we notice the staring floodlights under the grating at the Statue of Liberty gazing at us, wide-eyed, then the circles formed by other technological or architectural features double as a discrete chorus of passively inquisitive eyes. Look at that cartoonish fire hydrant with eyes and ears cheekily eavesdropping on the wailing wall from its perch by the steel fence. Then there are all those windows, etymologically wind eyes, offering their own form of blank surveillance. But mainly, of course, it's people who are looking. In their way, the destinations in Vault Fass are monumental equivalents of Sylvia Plath's mirror. But instead of a solitary viewer occasionally coming into view, they are each day treated to an international cast of thousands turning up to relieve the long monotony of time. Often the view includes a road leading out of shot, back into the city from which these pilgrims and visitors have trudged and swarmed. They come to see, to pay their respects and to make and take souvenirs of their seeing in the form of photographs. Magnificent in themselves and, for many centuries, content to bask in the sunlight and rain of their mythic renown, these monuments have, in the last century and a half, become increasingly dependent on the tributes paid to them in the form and currency of photographs. If Martin Parr, in his book Small World, showed this economy in action, then in a perfect world, a perfect small world, as it were, one of Curtis's pictures would show Parr in the process of snapping a grinning group of Chinese or a couple of earnest Scandinavians. That would circle the photographic square, so to speak. Without the daily and annual testimony of photographs, monuments would crumble in the sense that they would disappear from tourists' itineraries. How could a place be worth visiting if no one had bothered photographing it? Effectively, it would cease to exist. And so, in a sense, views of rubble and garbage-strewn emptiness at Giza or Hollywood are prophetic glimpses of what such places, sites of eroded or vacated meaning, might look like when that has come to pass. In this light, their photographs showing a world in which there is no reason to go somewhere and nothing to see when you get there. In such a world, there are only photographs and, look, behind you, people looking at them.